Hey guys, welcome to the Becca Cook Show. Today I have a very special guest. A lot of you are will probably be familiar with him. If not, you're going to wa want to watch this episode. Um, he is the author of a couple of books. One is Out of a Far Country that he co-authored with his mother. It's a brilliant uh, memoir and it's I highly recommend it. It's amazing. And his other book, his most recent book is called Holy Sexuality and the Gospel which we'll be getting into today. And uh, he has he's was a teacher at the Moody Bible Institute for over 10 years. And he has a speaking ministry. And he now lives in California, which is amazing. He moved from Chicago to California. And so welcome, Christopher Yuan. Oh, thank you, Beckett. This is so cool to be on with you. Really appreciate you and your ministry and your, your book. It's, you know, praise the Lord. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you. It's an honor for, to have you on the show. So let's begin. Before we get into holy sexuality and the gospel, uh, let's just tell us your story, because a lot of people are going to be familiar with your story, but there's definitely a lot who are, this is the first time they've heard of you. So tell us your story, because it's one of the most insane, powerful <laughs> testimonies I've ever heard. So well, let's... Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, there's a lot of intersections between your story and my story. I mean, obviously, just, you know, uh, not only coming to faith and, and sexuality, but um, I was not raised in a Christian home. Uh, and being Chinese, I wrestled with not only my identity with, am I Chinese? And I, am I American? But wrestling with same sex attractions from a really young age. My parents not being Christian, not not introducing me to any type of faith, um, didn't have any foundation or grid work uh, to think through sexuality, and especially in the Chinese culture. You know, you're from LA, so you know, uh, you know, in, in the Chinese culture, in the Asian culture, in the Latin culture, uh, we don't talk about sex and sexuality, but it's still there. It's it's brewing underneath. Yes. So wrestled with my sexuality. I, I, you know, came out of the closet in my early 20s, which, you know, of course, nowadays, that's, that's really late. But being uh, raised in the 70s, and, you know, my teenage years in the 80s, that was that was fairly common, lots of stigma back then, we don't talk about it. We didn't talk about it, not only in, in, in the Asian context, but in any context. So I, I came out when I was tw early 20s, and I'm from, I was born and raised in Chicago. I was going to dental school in Louisville, Kentucky, came out, told my parents, devastated my mom. And I don't know, Beckett, if you ever heard of the term tiger mom. Yes, of so, course. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. There's a book about tiger mom. Oh, of course. Yes, yes. Yes. And so, you know, being kind of your, uh, you know, a, a typical Asian mom wanted to control, control the situation. So she gave me an ultimatum, choose the family or choose this. Well, you know, as, as we know or knew, uh, I believe this is not a choice. This is who I am. So I told my mom, if you can't accept me, I've got no other choice but to leave. And, and it's so interesting, you know, which is why, you know, in our first, first book, I wanted people to really hear her voice, not only just mine, because from my perspective, I was just kicked out of the home. From her perspective, uh, her perspective, I just rejected her, rejected the family, rejected everything. Was you know, your so and was, was your father behind? I mean, was he also in agreement with her to kick you, you know, out of the house? Yeah, the very interesting thing was um, it was just like a perfect storm that all of this came kind of, in a sense, crashing down, at least from my mother's perspective, because my parents' marriage was a wreck. And they... Um, they actually began the paperwork for a divorce. So they, were, they weren't ever really on the same page about everything. Right. <laughs> and, and my brother and I, we heard that every day. So they, he, my dad was like, live and let live, who cares? You know, just be happy. Uh, so they, they weren't really seeing, and, and, and I wouldn't say that my dad was like, you know, oh yeah, go for it. He just was like, well, oh, whatever, you know, just, mm -hmm. I, I, he wasn't, for it wasn't against it, uh, which then added to my mother's frustration because he's like, you got to care, you know, and my mom and my dad was like, ah, so it, it, he wasn't necessarily against or supportive, but he was really just about just let him be, let me be, let us all be. 
<laughs> Let it be. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Uh, so my mom gave me this ultimatum. I left home, went back to Louisville, devastated my mom. And just her story was, this was really the straw that broke the camel's back. And she, as the way she tells her testimony is she had actually resolved to end her life after this. Wow. And it wasn't because I came out. It was because her, the marriage was a disaster. Um, her kids were rebelling in a sense. My, my brother was also doing his own thing. So it was as, as a Chinese mother, she was a failure. That's, mm -hmm. that's how, you know, with a, when an Asian mother, their whole world is their family. And when all of that came crashing down, it was kind of like her last ray of hope. That was just, well, then there's no more reason to live. God in his providence, uh, uh, she, she went to see this minister. Remember, she's not a Christian, so that's why it's so, so ironic. She went to see this minister, minister who gave a little pamphlet on homosexuality, bought a one-way Amtrak ticket to Louisville, Kentucky, where I had already left. And she was going to say goodbye to me for the last time before ending it all. She, ending it all. On the train, she began reading this pamphlet, which shared with her the gospel that she had never heard before. No one ever. She knew Christians, but and she did not. She despised Christians. Actually, she never had she had she heard the gospel. And and how did she find this? Who? How did she even find this Christian minister? Yeah. So my father taught at Loyola Dental School uh, part time. And he, he was, you know, he had his own practice, but one day a week he would go and teach. And uh, this Loyola is a, is a Jesuit school. And so my dad, would, and they were, they were close friends with a chaplain there. So she went to see this chaplain. I mean, she's just like, I don't know of any religious right. person, but this guy, <laughs> you know, at least she knew other people that were Christian, but just, they were not walking. They, they were, they did not give a good, uh, a good testimony to, to the name of Christ. Mm -hmm. So she thought, well, I'm going to talk with him. And she doesn't remember anything she said, he said, but he gave her this, this little booklet and it shared with her the, the gospel uh, that she's a sinner and yet God still loves her. And so my mother became a Christian and she had very much a radical transformation on that day in the middle of May in 1996. Um, I'm sorry, 1992. She became a Christian within a few months. My father did as well, but I was like, whatever, you know, you guys, good for you, not for me. Well, I was in dental school and just living, living in the world and doing what all my friends were doing, which was have fun, party. And I was going out to the clubs, going out to the bars. And, and unfortunately, I started experimenting with drugs. And, and, and it's, you know, I always need to clarify with my testimony. And I don't know if you need to do the same, but I don't want to paint this picture that my story reflects everyone else's story. Not right. all gay men do drugs. Not right. all gay men are promiscuous. Certainly some are, some are not, but that is right. part of my story. But um, I also began selling drugs while in dental school too. And it was, uh, I, I sold to fr friends, classmates, even a professor. Cause I, I, in my mind, I thought I could have, have it all. I could have, you know, being a graduate student by day and a promiscuous drug dealer by night. <laughs> But three months before I was received my doctorate, the administration of the school expelled me. So I moved from Louisville. So you were so. I mean, obviously, you were devastated by that, right? I mean, well, yeah. I, I, and and I thought that I was going to, you know, you just you feel invincible at that age, but also, yeah. I mean, the drugs don't help. <laughs> you know, it, when, when I saw you remember Charlie Sheen when he was on the news, and and I was like, oh my goodness, how you know, I'm like. I understand where he's coming from because yeah. you think you're Superman, like no one, you know, uh, you know, win, you're always going to win. And, and so it was, um, uh, you, you fool yourself in, into thinking that you're, you can do whatever you want and there's not mm -hmm. going to be any consequences. So moved to Atlanta and I kept doing what I knew how to do best, which is have fun, live it up. You live once. Um, so I kept, partying and of course you know compared to louisville atlanta was a big city and i kept selling drugs i actually became a supplier and this whole time my parents had no clue that i was even doing drugs but they knew that i needed christ but didn't and, what did your parents think about you being i mean what what did they think about you getting kicked out of dental school 
Oh, well, they were devastated. I mean, so, you know, I mean, devastated, yes, because that, that was like, that was how everything was going to fit into the plan. I was going to graduate from dental school and then I was going to go home and be a part of my dad's practice. Right. Um, so in my mind, I thought, well, you know, you're going to then help me and you're going to, they actually flew to Louisville. I thought to fight to keep me in school. My dad's knew the Dean. He's a dentist. He knew the Dean very well. So I, all they needed to do was a threat and a lawsuit to the school. And I would stay in school. Actually, that's what uh, another student had done. And, and, and he was very similar situation. Senior year, he kind of got expelled or in trouble. The, his parents, who was also a dentist, uh, sued the school or, or, or threatened you know, legal action. And he stayed in school, got his doctorate, got his degree and, and went on. So I'm like, that's all that's we, we have the plan. That's all you need to yeah. do. They did not do that. <laughs> My mom, and, and I'm so glad that just in her obedience to God, um, did his will, which, which was, she, she prayed, God, do you know, what, what is your will? And in the meeting, my mom told the Dean, it's not important that Christopher becomes a dentist. What's more important is that Christopher becomes a Christ follower. Right. And your mom, you talk about this, your mom prayed that prayer, which is scary, which is like, <laughs> God, do what, whatever it takes to save my son. And, whatever it takes. and yeah, it's so, that's a scary prayer. That's a scary and, and prayer. So many times, mom, you know, mothers are like, I'm not there yet. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but my mom was just desperate. It was just so hopeless. Um, she just gave up. And, and, even people like, oh, you have so much faith. And my mom will even say, I had no faith. <laughs> it was in her desperation. She said, I can't do anything. I can't change my son. I can't fix him. God, you have to. And, and the worst thing is when we get in God's way, right? We, God's going to act. God's going to use consequences and circumstances. But what do we do? We, we take those circumstances away and we soften things up for, for our loved ones. Um, and, and, you know, it's really just oftentimes viewed as enabling. Uh, so my mom and dad, they, they actually went to Louisville kind of thinking, okay, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe we will just say, you know, fight and, and, and try to help keep my son in school. But, and your mom, by the way, she, she was very into her prayer closet. <laughs> yeah. she, this was like my sister-in-law and my family, like, your, but your mother, I think, as you said in your book, you, she, I think she fasted every Monday for you yes. for years yeah. and years. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so my, it, it, yeah. Oh, go ahead. My, my siblings are my, and my, uh, some of my siblings did that as well. Wow. Praise the Lord. Praise I, just something about people covering us in prayer when yeah. we have no interest in the Lord. Yeah. So I, I, I and my mom thought that was going to be rock bottom, getting expelled from dental school. I mean, how, how much worse can that get? Well, it can. <laughs> Went to Atlanta, started selling drugs. They even came to visit me in Atlanta. Um, and they, you know, they, they wanted to share Christ with me. I, I, and after the second day, I kicked them out. They, they weren't preaching at me. Like that's, that's the narrative that we hear today, that Christian parents who believe the teachings of the Bible who hold to the gospel cannot love their gay children. They have to actually get rid of all that ancient antiquated teaching to love their gay children. I had the exact opposite experience. My mom and dad were not Christian. They rejected me. It wasn't until they became followers of Christ that they knew, knew that they could do nothing other than to love their, their gay son. Yeah. And your mother so, even wrote you cards and was like, I yeah, love you forever. I love, forever. you know, forever. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So um, I kicked them out. My dad gave me his Bible and I threw it in the trash can. I'm like, I want nothing to do with that. So that was, you know, my mom and dad knew I was just hopeless. And they, they enlisted over a hundred prayer warriors from the church, from the Bible study fellowship group. My mom fasted every Monday for seven years, once fasted 39 days on my behalf. Cause like I said, Whoa. she was desperate. <laughs> and amazing. she just prayed that God would do whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son home. So, and, and, and more importantly, actually to him, not, not necessarily just home in the sense of, you know, family home, them, right. but home to the Lord, our true home. And um, well, that prayer came with a bang on my door, open on my doorstep, on my doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police and two big German shepherd dogs, <laughs> confiscated my money drugs. I was charged with the equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. And so I was facing 10 years, 10 years to life. 
couple of days after that, I was walking around the cell block, passed by this garbage can, and I'm like, this is my life. About to pass it by, and there's something on top of the trash. Bent over, pick it up, and it was a Gideon's New Testament. Took it back to my cell, opened up that good book, and you know, I wasn't thinking, oh, this is the answer. I just thought, I've got tons of time on my hands. Yeah. But as we know, Beckett, as your watchers know, what we have in our Bibles, and this is so important, what we have in our Bibles is not just ink on paper, but it's the very breath of God. Right. And it is living, powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword. Well, it was convicting of my sin. And I'm like, wait, you know, people are like, this is good news. This was not good news for me at that moment. Well, things got worse. I was called to the nurse's office and she gave me the news that I was HIV positive. So a couple of days after that, I was laying in my bed, just, I mean, I, I was thinking I've destroyed my life. I was sentenced to six years. Um, and um, I saw something on the metal bunk above me and it said, if you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. For right. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And any verse could have been on there, but God used that verse to tell me that. And, and reading the verses after that, how, how God was even going to call them out of exile. And I'm like, I'm in exile. <laughs> I'm in prison, in this prison cell. And God, if he could use this, this rebellious nation, Israel, that wanted nothing to do with God, that was in exile, in, a, in essence, in prison, he could have a plan for me. Well, I didn't know what, what that meant. But God gave me enough faith to get through that one day and the next. So God began convicting me of my dependencies like drugs. But within a few months, he delivered me from that addiction. And he kept bringing to mind other idols. And man, there was this one thing that, that I felt like I just couldn't let go of my sexuality. Went to a chaplain. And to my surprise, this chaplain told me the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality. Even gave me a book. And I'm like, great. Right. Finally, I can <laughs> have my cake and eat it too. I can have you know, gay relationships and Christianity, my religion, everything inside of me wanted to affirm this book that the chaplain gave me. But I know now that it was God's indwelling Holy Spirit that convicted me that those assertions from that book were a clear distortion of God and his word. I couldn't even finish that book. I wonder if it was Peter. It wasn't Peter Gomes book, right? No. Okay. No. Cause I, I read a book a years ago, similar to that, but yeah, go ahead. it was, yeah. it was John Boswell's book and not even his, the, the more popular book. It was on, um, um, same sex relationships in medieval, um, I don't know what it, medieval times or whatever. Yeah. So, uh, but it was, and so I was like, okay, let me just look at the Bible. If the past, if this chaplain says the Bible doesn't, you know, condemn homosexuality. I was like, I want to read that for myself. So I went through the whole Bible. I went cover to cover several times looking for anything and I couldn't find any. So I was at this turning point, either abandon God in his word, live as a gay man, pursue a monogamous same sex relationship by allowing my attractions to dictate who I was and how I lived or abandon pursuing a monogamous same-sex relationship by freeing myself from my sexuality and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. My decision was clear and obvious. I followed Jesus. Praise God. <laughs> so as the days and the weeks of abstinence passed, I realized, wait, my sexuality does not have to be the core of who I am. You know, I told myself before, God loves me unconditionally, true. But as a sinner, I like to add to God's truth, right? Don't we all like, you know, we like to kind of refine God's truth, soften it. So I added, so therefore God doesn't want me to change. But I realized that unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval right. of my behavior. My identity shouldn't be defined by my sexuality. My identity shouldn't be grounded in my desires, whether sexual or romantic. My identity is not gay. It's not ex-gay. It's not even heterosexual for that matter. Because my identity as a child of the living God must be in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. God says, <laughs> be that. holy, for I am holy, right? I mean, yeah. and, and before becoming a Christian, and you probably you know, felt this too, I felt that Christians were telling me, people like us, that you had to become heterosexual. What, what does that mean? Well, I need to be sexually attracted women. And I also felt, I thought that 
man, the more sexually attracted I were to lots and lots of women, the more of a Christian man I would be, right? A ma real man's man. <laughs> but as I read the Bible, I thought, but even if I had opposite sex attractions, I would still need to flee temptation daily right. and I would need to resist sin. So heterosexuality, it's the correct direction, but it's not specific enough and too broad. And I mean, God doesn't command us be heterosexual for I'm heterosexual, right. but neither did, did he say be homosexual for I'm homosexual. Instead, God said, be holy for I am holy. So the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. That's not the goal, but the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. As a matter of fact, the opposite of every sin is holiness. Which and is a perfect segue into ho yes. holy sexuality in the gospel. And so I just want to ask you, um, Kind of, I have a bunch of questions on this, but first of all, just really quickly, how did you even come up, I mean, with the concept of holy sexuality? Because it it is such a like, it's such a kind of, when I first heard your of your book and when I first heard that title, I was like, wait, that's such a great way to frame it. Mm. Yeah, you know, the, the phrase obviously is is something new that, that you know, people haven't heard of. And so, you know, th there always needs to be uh, an explanation of what that phrase means. And, uh, and, I, and I, would, I would argue that even though the phrase, the two words are new, I, you know, I think the concept is just biblical. Right. And so it birthed out of my frustration of saying, okay, if historically the the modern church has not actually been correct in in lifting up heterosexuality as the standard mm -hmm. um then what is god's standard i mean if, if if god is perfect in his ways if he's not a god of confusion if he clearly has communicated his ways to us then what is it that that god commands of us when it comes to sexuality, our sexual desires, our behaviors, our relationships. What is it? And, and, and I just was so frustrated because it's like, okay, same-sex relationships are sinful. Uh, the desires are sinful. The temptation is rooted in our sin nature. So that, that's, that's not God's will. It's, it's a result of the fall. Then does that then mean then heterosexuality is the standard, but like just you can't go through a book in the Bible without seeing heterosexual sin <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and calling it out as not good as not his will. So heterosexuality, broadly speaking, is 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 too uh, and it's a secular framework as well, rooted in personhood, not just behavior and experience. So I thought, man, there has to be a better concept, a better way to communicate his, his will. So I was like, okay, let's just read the Bible. And, and, and a lot of the, this concept came from when I was in prison, you know, I mean, you want time, you know, a lot of us were like, oh, I'm so busy. I don't have time. Well, God in his you know, sovereignty was like, I'm going to give you lots of time, <laughs> yeah. put you in prison and even isolate me from who I saw as my family. I mean, as you know, we called our gay friends, our, you know, yeah. family. And so I needed to be disconnected from that, not just from the world, but from all my friends, from my family, to then allow the Holy Spirit to, to re renew my mind. And it was in prison that I realized heterosexuality, that cannot be the standard. Right. Um, certainly marriage. I mean, that that is obviously something that's lifted up. But what about singleness? I mean, I'm not I was not married. Um, I was not, you know, even before being in prison, I was, I had, you know, several relationships that lasted a little while, but, but we never got to the point where we decided to have a ceremony or anything like that. Uh, so, you know, I wasn't in any type of relationship like that. And now as a, as, as a, as a single man, I, I'm not married. So it's like, how am I going to live not being in a relationship? The Bible doesn't say anything about those of us who are unmarried. Uh, I'm sorry, not the Bible. Uh, the, the phrase heterosexuality. Let me right. let me correct that. The phrase right. heterosexuality does not say anything about unmarried. The Bible certainly does, and so uh, heterosexuality came out of just my frustration of saying there has to be a better way of clearly articulating God's ways, which is quite simply chastity and singleness or faithfulness in marriage. Right, and so is that what you mean? Because I think you just touched on this when you make this distinction in the book about who we are versus how we are. Mm -hmm. Very it's much so because, um, you know, so in Holy Sexuality in the Gospel, I, 
I begin this book on identity because I think that is the one thing, one of the many things that that Christians who don't come up from a past like we do or were raised in the church uh, miss when it comes to sexuality, that certainly we see it as sinful behavior, that is. But when we try to understand those in the LGBTQ community, when we try to share the gospel and engage with them, uh, with, uh, w- with Christ, we try to simply approach this or merely approach this as sinful behavior and don't understand the other main major error which is being made, which is making sexuality who we are. Mm-hmm. It makes our desires, our attractions, um, our behaviors, our relationships a part of our essence, personhood, because that's how you and I believe. This is, I would not say, oh, this is what I do. I wouldn't say, oh, this is what I feel. No, I said, this is who I am. And that's why it's so offensive to those, our friends and loved ones in the gay community, because when we talk about this as sin, well, you just called my whole person from head to toe as reprehensible to God. And right. so if we can understand that as Christians, that a big error that's made is uh, making sexuality who you are when it really is how you are, uh, that, that can help us better understand the world, better understand our LGBT loved ones and friends, and be able to share the gospel with them. Yeah, and you talk about this in holy sexuality and the gospel, you, what is, what's the relationship between the Imago Dei, the image of God that we're all created in and human sexuality? Yeah. You know, well, and it's because if, if sexuality is not who we are and, and we also put on a heap on ourselves, a lot of other false identities, you know, I'm a lawyer, I'm a, you know, football player. I'm a, you know, I, I love gaming, whatever it is, you know, we, we make things we do or things we like our identity when the Bible tells us who we are. So to really better understand human sexuality, we need to begin with theological anthropology. And I know that's a big word and you know, you, you've gone to Talbot, but I'm not gonna assume everyone has gone to, to, to seminary, but theological anthropology is essentially the study of humanity through God's eyes. Who are we according to God? Not, not according to kind of what the world says or kind mm-hmm. of the, disciplines of anthropology in our secular colleges, which is more of a comparative analysis of different cultures. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about who are we at the core of our being? And God says essentially two things. One, we're created in God's image, Genesis 1. But that isn't all. It goes on to the fall. So there is, which is why we need Christ. And so that's why it's really key to begin there, that it's the imago Dei. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about that as well in the church, because there's, you know, there, there, uh, some of the verses that, that mention it doesn't really go in depth. And I think that was intentional, uh, but it's, it's still a core doctrine of Christianity mm-hmm. that all humanity is created in God's image. Christ is the perfect image of God. And that's why that we are being more uh, conformed to the likeness of Christ. So I think that's really key to better understanding because that helps us to see our gay neighbor, our transgender friend has been created in God's image. That's different than being a child of God. A lot of times people kind of incorrectly make them equivalent. They're not. The Bible sees them as different categories. Every human being is created in God's image, which gives them dignity, value, and and respect. But not everyone is a child of God because before we were children of God, we were children of wrath, as Paul says. It's only because of Christ who reconciled us by grace through faith that now we are adopted as sons and daughters. So there's a difference there. So not every person is a child of God, but every person is created in God's image. So therefore, that should uh, make us want to reflect the image of Christ to those who are perishing um, to show them the true image of God, who is, who is Jesus. So that's why it's really important for us to understand that and, and have that framework of theological anthropology, creating God's image, but also, you know, the, the, rea- the reality of the doctrine of the fall. Right. And you say that, um, you say that there is a natural and a moral consequence of the fall. What, what's the distinct, distinction between those two? 
Yeah. And, and, the, and it's, you know, people have named it different things, um, you know, because I've had someone that was like, well, everything is all moral in a sense, because it's, it's, a you know, the fall of Adam and Eve. But when I say natural, I'm talking about these things that 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 is not necessarily specifically associated with sinful behavior, uh, actual mm -hmm. sin. So for example, um, diabetes, you know, that's, that right. wasn't a result of, um, any, any person's actual sin, you know, apart from original sin, Adam and Eve, but, um, or let's just say down syndrome, um, you know, these things are, are the effects of the, of a fall that don't, aren't correlated with sinful behavior. Uh, but on, on the other end, we have, you know, moral effects of the fall, like um, same sex attractions, uh, that is uh, a moral effect of the fall that is closely linked with sinful behavior. Alcoholism, that could be another. Yeah, example. and even even heterosexual attraction. Oh, yeah. You know, Porno pornography, pornography you know, or, or even uh, you know, addiction men, to pornography. Yeah, and men or women who desire partners other than their spouse or whatever. Yes, poly yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all, yeah, or, those or, are all results of the fall. And so what do you say to... Well, a couple of things. What do you say to the idea that, <laughs> I mean, this is so in the culture, obviously, but that, you know, get, you're born this way. Like if, mm. if I'm born gay, then well, how could it be wrong? What, what God created me this way? Like how in, in the world could this be wrong? Yeah. Well, and, and, and so from a, you know, just a anecdotal perspective, you know, it, definitely felt like that for me, you know, as long as I, you know, in, in, you probably said the same thing. Oh, I remember as long as I remember I've been this way or, you know, I didn't choose this. But then when we look at the actual science, uh, you'll realize that the verdict is still out. Right. Nothing's conclusive. Uh, even the latest study um, done in 2019, and, and I did a video uh, for the Colson Center for Christian Worldview called Is Being Gay Genetic? And I, I go over that, uh, the latest study in 2019. And even there, they were just able to find, you know, five genetic markers, not genes, but gen markers that together maybe uh, could account for 1% of the development of same sex attractions. So it's really, the verdict is out. That study hasn't even been replicated. So we don't really know. It's, it's very likely that it's a combination of multiple factors, not just genes, mm -hmm. not just some biological factors, but also other factors as well. But theologically, and this is where I think sometimes as Christians will we'll answer that question with, you know, critiquing all the science out there, but, but we don't do theological reflection, which is, which is you know, the most important thing for us to do beginning with theological anthropology, we're created in God's image. We're also living all of us because of the consequences of the fall. And that was not a choice. So right. people say, well, I didn't choose this. Well, as a Christian, <laughs> we should know that I didn't choose to have a sin nature. I, that was not my choice. We're all born with uh, uh, you know, with a, a nature to sin. And then later we just simply choose to sin. Right. So it, you know, the argument that, well, you know, I've been this way for as long as I remember fits right into a, an understanding of humanity as Christians. Well, you yeah. can choose this that also fits in as well. Yeah. And I always say this, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're born gay, if it's genetic, if it's hormonal in utero and uterine, I don't know, which is the correct term. But if, it, if it's hormonal or if it's environmental or a combo platter, it's it's a moot point because we're all born in sin. We're all conceived. Right. Yeah. And, and, so, and, and, I, and we're all born with innate impulses and we don't necessarily, need, or we, we're not necessarily supposed to act on those innate sinful impulses. That's right. And, and, and I tell people... Um, you know, that as much as people like to say the Bible is irrelevant, it is not because that's a huge question for people. But the, but Jesus actually provides us the answer. And it comes in John chapter three, where it says you must be born again. So it doesn't matter whether you think you're born an alcoholic, you need to born, be, be born again. It doesn't matter if you think you're born an adulteress, you must be born again. Yeah, so I think and that's really the key thing that applies for every human being. And that takes a lot of pressure off of parents whose children are gay, because yes. a lot of parents think it's their fault. And it's like, mm -hmm. no, actually, 
this is the fault of the fall. Like <laughs> this is, it's not your fault. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think, I mean, do you agree with that statement or? Oh, 100%. And, yeah. you know, that, and that's a big part of, um, you know, oftentimes I've, I've been adding that in, in my talks from the stage and, and I'll take a, kind of take a pause and, and I'll, I'll address the, the concept of uh, de developmental theory and, and how that, that is actually just an incorrect diagnosis that we've diagnosis as a psychological disorder not as what the Bible diagnoses this, which is our sin nature. There's only one root cause. People like to say the root causes are absentee father, dominant mother, abuse in one's childhood. But scripture calls the root cause of our sinful behavior, not on faulty parenting, but on original sin and our sin nature, which then points to the correct treatment, which is Jesus Christ. So right. I, I tell parents, um, you know, although you're beating yourself up and, and thinking that, that you're the, you're to blame, you know, it's just not your fault. And then so many times after I say that, it's just, it's just really, uh, a lot of parents are, uh, are moved and, and they yeah. weep because they, they've been blaming themselves. Their, their spouses are blaming each other. Uh, church members are blaming them. Church leaders are doing that. Counselors are blaming them. Uh, you know, so it's uh, books are blaming them. You know, r radio hosts are blaming them. And so it's it's really unfortunate that uh, sometimes I feel like we're we're busier chasing after Freud than Christ, because because right. that's really what that's that that is grounded in, and totally um, that it's a Freudian framework that your past or I mean your your present woes and struggles is is bound up and blamed in our past. Yeah. I like that. And so, and you talk about um, temptation regarding same-sex attraction. Uh, is is same-sex temptation a sin? Yeah. And, and it's great that you framed it like that because the question that we often hear is, well, is same-sex attraction sin? And there's a lot of debate in, you know, in, in the world that we live in among Christians uh, people who speak on sexuality, there's this debate. Well, it is a sin. No, it's not a sin. And and I've heard both sides. And and I believe so much can be actually resolved. Uh, well, of course, maybe not. There won't be complete resolution, but a lot can be resolved if we would number one um, define our terms, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or just uh, agree on using the same terms. And 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 the reason why I think there's so much confusion is because attraction is a very nebulous word that is hard to define. Um, and then it makes it more difficult when people just kind of throw in love. Um, I, I, I think it's, we need to be very careful with, um, because I think love is one of the most misused, abused and misunderstood words in our culture today. But attraction is not a word that's found in the Bible, but temptation and desire is. So when, when we're talking about is it sinful or not, I'd much rather, since sin, sin is a biblical category, I'd much rather than continue to use biblical categories like temptation and desire. Well, same-sex temptation, well, let's start with desire. There, there's this misunderstanding that, that um, our desires turn into lust, but doing a lexical you know, study of these terms in Hebrew and Greek, you'll find that actually the word translated for desire in Hebrew is the same word that's translated as covet in the Ten mm -hmm. Commandments, the same Hebrew word. Same thing for desire. The word for desire, epithumia in Greek, is the same word that we translate as lust. It's just context. So it's not then, at, at least using the biblical categories, it's not then that desire turns into lust. It's just that wrongly ordered, incorrect desire is lust. It is sin. Right. So same-sex attractions, uh, whether sexual or romantic, are sinful, Platonic ones are not. Those are good desires, uh, you know, that I would have for my brother and the Lord. Those are good. But temptation, and this is where it gets, you know, some debate about how you understand James 1 and stuff. I, you know, I think temptation in and of itself is not actual sin, but it's rooted in original sin. And, and I think there is also... Um, a differentiation between kind of an external temptation as Jesus was 
uh, tempted externally by Satan. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's possible that what James 1 is talking about is there that, that internal temptation that comes out of our own sinful heart. And, uh, but anyway, I think it's important for us to see that the temptation is an actual sin, but it can quickly turn into sin. And so we should be very careful not to celebrate it, not to uh, say that somehow we can sanctify it or good can come out of that, but it's, it's definitely rooted in the fall and we need to flee it and resist it and be very careful not to play with it. Well, that's what, uh, that's an interesting thing. It's a good segue because uh, my next question is there are, there is a whole kind of community of quote unquote ex gays who are cell or who are following Christ who are celibate, but they still want to, engage in romantic relationships with the same mm -hmm. sex, but not yeah. erotic ones. Now, right. what, so what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. And, and, and I have, um, several people that I know, um, that I've been, uh, friends with that are in that community. And I'm, I, you know, I, I, I obviously respect that, that they uh, appreciate that they are not pursuing same sex, uh, sexual, same sex relationships. But I think what happens is an oversimplification of sexuality. Um, well, okay, there's two errors that they're making, I believe. It's an oversimplification of what sexuality is and then broadening the category of sexuality a bit too far. And, and this is what I mean. Let me kind of go over here. They're oversimplifying sexuality to merely two categories, either the sexual aspect and the non-sexual. Mm -hmm. So individuals you know, in this community they will say, you know, we agree to the traditional, you know, Christian uh, view of biblical sexuality, which I, I, I don't agree that that is the biblical because they're limiting it just to the sexual aspect, but they will say that. So the sexual aspect, uh, for example, um, sexual behavior and sexual desires, those are sinful and we need to resist that. So that's where I can agree with them. Where I don't agree is then they, then they say and imply everything else is okay. So all mm -hmm. the other non-sexual ones are okay. And, and to be honest, that is, is a very androcentric understanding of sexuality. What do I mean by that? Uh, that treats sexuality from a male-centered perspective where it is very much more erotic and sexual. As we know, lesbians, their relationships are often you know, either devoid of the erotic and the, mm -hmm. and the sexual and the physical, or it's not important. I mean, I know, you know, I've known many lesbians were like, oh yeah, we have sex, but I, I could totally do without that. I don't know very make, many gay men that, that would actually say that. Of course there are some, yeah. but, but, you know, so for a less, so to, to have that framework uh, really does not understand uh, the broader aspect of sexuality and try to oversimplify. So that's why in Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, I talked about actually three categories, not just the sexual aspect of same-sex sexual attractions and same-sex sexual behavior and desires, but actually the romantic aspect. And then the other one is platonic. And I know people then are going to argue, well, what's the difference between, you know, there's such a gray line, it blurs the line. Yes, it, it can be seem like a blurred line, but as we get older, you know, I'm 50. So as, as I get older, I've learned when I was 20, I could not, it was so hard for me to dis distinguish between a friend and like a lover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm not talking about the sexual. I'm just talking about someone who I was really romantically attracted to. I felt like, oh, I, I, and I blurred those lines all the time, which is why I had so much trouble with, you know, relationships before I, I, I was open about my sexuality. And, uh, but I think we know now, and I gave like two chapters of examples in Holy Sexuality in the Gospel, like your heart skips a beat, you know, like you're at work and all you can think about while you're working is, you know, I wonder if he's thinking about me right now. You know, I'm not going to say that about my best friend. I'm not going to say yeah. that about my mom or dad. <laughs> um, or, you know, you see them and you get sweaty palms, right? That doesn't happen with my, you know, right. my pastor or whatever. If it does, then, then I know then there's, that's, that's where you kind of, pat, you know, cross that line. And I think it's important for us to parse those out because I know someone else that says, oh my goodness, do I have to go through life parsing out every single desire? And it's like, yeah, I mean, I think we do. I, I think to deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me, to take every thought captive, I, I think that's just what scripture is calling us to do. And, and that's not like a, 
a legalistic, woe is me, I'm, I'm in such bondage. No, I, I feel like because of my devotion to the Lord of God who saved me and, I mean, gave me so many blessings in the midst of me running and rebelling from him, I, I want to do that. I mean, just as a husband wants to do things for his wife, not out, out of obligation because he truly loves her. I mean, just you and I know this passage so well. He, you know, the, the one who is forgiven much, loves much. And I'm like, that's me. <laughs> right. I've been forgiven so much more than I deserve. Yeah. Uh, so there is that sense of, you know, of that, that clear distinction between not, oh, you know, oversimplifying, but then this other aspect of not broadening out sexuality too far, because these individuals that I know who would identify, you know, side B or celibate gay Christians, they would say, well, my sexuality, my same thing, you know, being gay is sanctifiable. So they view their sexuality and aspects of their sexuality to be inclusive of platonic same-sex relationships and mm -hmm. friendship. Uh, and that's where I would push back and I would disagree. I do not think that uh, these platonic desires, platonic relationships are included in, now it could be included in kind of intimacy broadly, uh, now, uh, you know, understood, but sexuality, because if that were the case, if we were to also include any desire that I have for anyone that's friendship, then my mom is bi. <laughs> my dad would be bi, yeah. you know, she would be lesbian. Uh, but yeah. so when we, it's, it's, it's blurring the categories and, you know, my book, I don't know if you noticed this, that the cover is really boring. It's black and white, mm -hmm. but I was actually very intentional because we're living in a world of infinite shades of gray, right? Not right. just 50, everything is gray. So I wanted to really communicate in the book and by the cover that God's truth his understanding of biblical sexuality, I mean, not his understanding, his communicating to us of biblical sexuality is not gray, but black and white. And, and I, too often we have the tendency to, to blur the lines. And, uh, and I think we need to be just really careful with that. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. It's so black and white. And that's why I think it's, un, it's really unhelpful to, for, for those who are following you know, ex-gays or whatever you want to call that, who are following Christ and who are celibate, to still call themselves gay Christians. That, that's why I never call myself a gay Christian because I think, why would I talk, speak about my old man, my old self that was crucified with Christ that's and right. use that as an adjective to describe me now? Like that, that doesn't make sense to me. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And so um, what does, uh, how, how does, how does, this is in your book too, how does the idea of sexual orientation fit in the Bible, because that's one of the big arguments, you know, the Matthew Vines of the world, who, who would say like, you know, the, in antiquity, the biblical authors wouldn't have understood sexual orientation like we do today. You know, you mentioned, you talk about this in your book. So kind of tell, tell us about that. Yeah, you know, because, you know, Matthew Vines and others will say, and even those, you know, who are gay celibate Christians say, well, the Bible doesn't really address the modern concept of sexual orientation. So Paul and Moses, when they were writing, uh, they were just kind of writing. And, and of course, they wouldn't say this, but it's implied. They were just ignorant. They, they, they don't understand. We're, they're, not, they're not enlightened as we are about sexuality. I would disagree with that. But let's just say for argument's sakes, they didn't know that when people make those type of statements, it really, it really belies their a low view of scripture that it really shows um, on, uh, you know, the, they put on their sleeve their their theology that mm -hmm. they don't hold to the doctrine of inspiration. Yes, biblical writers might not have understood what we understand today, but as we know, the word of God is not just written by a bunch of human authors. It's human authors who've been moved by the Holy Spirit to record his truth. So it's one thing to say that biblical writers didn't understand, but it's another thing to say that God didn't understand that. So I, I thought, well, the word sexual orientation might not be present, just, just like holy sexuality, that word 
is not present. And, and right. also, you know, we hear a lot today, you know, it's becoming this kind of more popular. I just got another email from a mother who asked me this question. Well, you know, what do you think about this argument that, you know, homosexual, the word homosexual and the concept homosexual was inserted into the English Bible in the 1950s? In 1946. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. And I did a whole episode on that. Okay, yes, good. And, you know, so what people don't realize is, yeah, to, to say that a word might not have existed is one thing, but that's not the same thing as saying the concept wasn't. I mean, a lot of people don't realize the he, in, in the Hebrew language, ancient Hebrew language, biblical Hebrew, there was no word for sex. It was either to know, mm -hmm. to lay down, you know, he saw her nakedness, those type of statements. But so if there was no word for sex, how would you have a word for homosexuality? <laughs> right. That doesn't mean that people in ancient Israel did not have a concept for sex. Of course they didn't. I mean, that's, that's, that's ludicrous to say. And so, you know, people who kind of put out this statement that, oh, there's no word implying that the concept was somehow also inserted, really don't understand linguistics, don't, they don't understand how language works. And they're really working in just, you know, the English language and not actually how we actually do exegesis, which is in the original languages. Um, but so sexual orientation, you know, all of the phrases and in the Bible, well, what about the concept? And what, what I was basically, you know, putting forth is, though the Bible doesn't necessarily have a specific concept of sexual orientation, but the concept of like an unchosen, immutable orientation or predisposition, that definitely is in the Bible. It's in nature. Paul, yeah. throughout the New Testament, uses the phrase flesh or sarks over and over and over and over again. Some translations uh, uh, render that word as uh, sinful nature. Right. And uh, that's not chosen. Uh, it's, it's a propensity in a sense. And, and, and this is also important that um, a predisposition, which I think is what, what a, sin, a sin nature in essence is, is not the same thing as a predetermination. Like the world right. likes to talk about it as this is, you know, this is the way you are and you can't help it. Uh, um, but it's a predisposition. I mean, even the most recent secular research Lisa Diamond, I don't know if you're familiar with her. She's, she's a, um, a feminist scholar at University of Utah, and she's done a lot of research on, on female sexuality, and she's written a book called Sexual Fluidity. <laughs> she's not a Christian. Um, and it, there's a lot of evidence out there that there's a, sexual sexuality is much more fluid, and, and particularly among women. Yes. Uh, but it's much I more fluid than people would say. Yeah, I mean, I had a lot of uh, female friends in, in college who yeah. were lesbians during that time, but now are heterosexual and married and have families that are happy. <laughs> so, yeah. and by the way, I mean, Paul in antiquity in, in the first century, Paul would have known about, I mean, there was so much in the Greco-Roman world going on sexually. And there were, there's lots of studies, that, you know, with, I mean, between Plutarch's writings and Plato and, and Xenophon, there are so much evidence of Mm -hmm. consensual, loving, homosexual relationships That's in right. antiquity that uh, when Paul, so it's, it's not like Paul's completely, you know, unaware. Right. He's <laughs> not an going ignoramus. <laughs> so he would have been aware. <laughs> he was of that. very informed. Yes. And you talk about, so you talk about singleness in your book and you, and how important the church is, uh, the local church being about being a part of the body of Christ so talk about how, talk about singleness and you, you even talk about uh, the gift of singleness and it's, it's not, you, you kind of frame it differently than I used to think it was. So tell us what is, what's the <laughs> gift of singleness? Yeah, well, and, and I've shifted a lot even because I've, I've studied it. Um, and even when I was writing, I've, I, I read a lot of different authors. Um, I think Barry Danilak is an individual that really influenced me a lot on this topic. He is a single man, um, I think in his 60s, and he um, uh, got his doctorate in England at Durham and mm -hmm. went to Wheaton for exegesis, similar to me, and now he's ministering in, in Calgary. Um, but he wrote a book called uh, Redeeming Singleness. Uh, John Piper wrote the foreword, um, but, and that's a wonderful book, but it's a little bit of a, a weightier book, more of a, it's not necessarily an academic book, but it's one of those trade books that is 
uh, a little bit requires a little bit more uh, theological um, acumen. Mm-hmm. And uh, but he wrote this little little booklet called the Theology of Singleness, and I know the the, the the title is not appealing, but it's only about twenty eight pages. It's super readable, and it blew my mind when it comes to singleness because it helped me better understand not only like a biblical theology of singleness, but a biblical theology of family. And what does that have to do? I mean, well, singles don't have families. No. The reason why this was important was because he, he drew the picture and he used biblical theology. So using the, 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 the arc of God's work in God's people, um, the, the narrative arc, uh, the biblical narrative arc of, of God working in his people, creation, fall, redemption, consummation, and showed how there's a progression of, of how God develops um, our, our understanding of singleness, which in the Old Testament, there's very little. And actually singleness is, it seems quite negative. There's a lot of emphasis, emphasis instead on family, having a name you pass on, having children. Um, but then in the New Testament, there's this sense of, yes, the, the New Testament talks about family and, and children and, and, and how to ha- have a household and stuff. But it actually develops it out to broaden out our understanding of family. Because in the Old, Old Testament, it was like, all about families. It was all about bloodlines. It was all mm-hmm. about uh, our tribes, our clans. And, but then the New Testament doesn't really talk about that as much. And instead it talks about the church, the body of believers, which is the family of God. Yes. So when we understand the way that the, I mean, you can't go through any New Testament book really without seeing over and over talking about brothers and sisters. We're brothers and sisters. I mean, the greatest chapter on love, First Corinthians 13, Paul didn't write that to husband and wife, even though it's, it's you know, that passage is talked about all the time in, in, <laughs> quoted, weddings. in, in weddings, right? Yeah. But actually Paul wrote that he was talking to the church. So we are called to love each other Love is patient, love is kind, et cetera. And that's, uh, that's how we really understand that. So what does that have to do with a single man, a single woman, everything? Because not only uh, the context in which the New Testament communicates intimacy is actually not friendship. So, because that, that's, that's kind of been pushed, pushed, pushed out a little bit, you know, what, what, what you and I need most is a best friend in the world. We needed a covenant friendship. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, that concept is really rooted in 11th century monastic and it's mystical mon- monastic Catholicism. And, and of course, I mean, th- there's things that we can learn from, from historical theology, but there's a lot of things that from historical theology that we need to learn from and say, no, that that's, that's not actually correct. Even the word celibacy is actually rooted not in scripture, but actually in Roman Catholic theology. And so I was like, well, I, I want to see what's, you know, be able to tease out the difference between kind of more historical theology and, and really theology grounded in scripture, sola scriptura. And so I, I kind of did this, just a, a look at friendship in, 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 in the Old Testament, and the New Testament. And surprisingly, even though it, the Bible does mention it a few times, it's almost silent. It doesn't really say much. Of course, Abraham was a friend of God. Of course, we are now a friend. You know, Jesus calls us, us friend. That's amazing. But other than that, it's not a lot. Even the quintessential example of male friendship is who? Jonathan David and, and David, Jonathan. right? Yeah. David and Jonathan. <clears throat> but what I found so interesting is never in the whole Bible are David and Jonathan called friends. They're call, they call each other brothers. And I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. Well, let me do a little study on brothers. Oh my goodness. I mean, the, the Bible just blew up. It's all over the place. Adelphos, brothers, sisters, family. And so really what, I think the reason why the Bible doesn't really kind of expound on the concept of friendship is because the Bible already provided the context for, for relationships and, and intimacy. And that's Family, of course, in the Old Testament, it was family, like your physical family. But then in the New Testament, that, that was expanding to say what, you know, God was saying, like, what I talked about in the Old Testament is actually just a reflection of what is the true meaning of family, which is the family of God. You know, the, the relationships that we have that are bound by physical blood, whether it's your brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, are actually only temporary. And right. you might be thinking, hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> 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 but actually, the only true relationships that we can carry on to, into eternity are those bound by, the, bound by the blood of Christ. So that means for singles that I actually have family. I actually 
can have and should have spiritual children. I mean, Paul was a father, mm -hmm. even though he wasn't married when he wrote the New Testament. And so I have fathers. I mean, Father's Day just passed. And so I, I wish all Christian men, you should be fathers. I mean, so happy Father's Day. You know, if, mm -hmm. if you are discipling people, then you are a father in a sense. And um, so I, I think just the key then is what's, what singles need is we just need the local church, the body of Christ to be the body of Christ. And I know you had a wonderful church to connect to. And that's, that's what I believe is what I need most. I don't necessarily need a special group of people, you know, um, that's outside the church that have all my same problem to kind of all come together so we can kind of commiserate. I don't need that. And I actually didn't have that in Chicago. And I think that that was good. I'm not saying that some people can have benefited from that. But honestly, I found those that have been uh, healthiest are those that are really strongly that if there's going to be any support group, it's the church. Yes. The that's local. why it's so important to be a part of the body of Christ, your local body of Christ. It's so crucial. Like I, Amen. I always, I just tell, cause there's so many younger friends of mine who are kind of millennials who were like, Oh, I just, it's just God and me. And we have this relationship. I don't need the church. I'm like, what? No, this is so, this is crucial and it's biblical. And it's, it's, it's like, you're commanded to be a part of this, uh, yeah, the bride I, of Christ. I, I know. I tell people, you can't love Christ and not love the body of Christ. It's just yeah. not possible. And so we have, uh, well, a couple of just last quick questions. What are some of the do's and don'ts when it comes to sharing Christ with the gay community? Yeah, well, I mean, this is, you already know all these really well, but I mean, little things, and it's sometimes terminology, and I know, I don't want to be like, oh, I'm the PC police, but uh, there's a sense where I, I want to be familiar with the terminology, uh, don't walk on any landmines, not like I'm walking on eggshells, but I want to, for the sake of building a relationship, building trust, so that I can have more opportunities to share the gospel with others. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, I tell people don't compare this with an addiction, pedophilia, like not all gay men are pedophiles. <laughs> don't compare it with bestiality, it's yeah. unhelpful. Oh my goodness, yeah. right. Don't use the words when we can, lifestyle and choice. And I get it. I mean, I know I, you know, cause we're separating our identity from our behavior. I get that, but I didn't. This, I this was all one. And so when we say lifestyle, we're minimizing someone's experience and and, uh -huh. and 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 even though it's it's incorrect for them to see and, and conflate the two but i'm willing to for the sake of the gospel to forego a certain word or two don't feel the need that you have to debate with people all the time and that's another one because many times people be like well they just asked me if this is sin i've got to you know tell the truth and and i think we don't always have to especially when they're argumentative like it's different if they're open like then right. we have this open door to speak truth so i'm not ever saying don't speak truth and don't answer that question. I'm just simply saying in, when we're pushed to that corner, someone's doing this, like, you know, pushing in your chest, we don't have to. And the reason is not because I'm trying to avoid, I'm afraid, but I'm taking the lead of Jesus. He did not answer every question. He was silent before Pilate. Sometimes he answered a question with the question. Other times he would provide an answer, just not to the question that they asked. So I always want to reframe it and bring around to the more redemptive question. For example, if someone asked, do you think this is sin? I could say, man, you know, my friend, I know you don't even believe in God. What does it matter to you what God thinks right now? So let's first talk about the existence of God. Those conversations, those conversations that can lead to talking about Christ can lead to salvation as opposed to simply talking about morality morality never saves anyone yeah and then what should you do i mean i think we just need to pray and fast we need yes. to uh i mean that that there's we cannot minimize that and trivialize that in any way shape or form we need to be intentional we need to go across the street invite that gay neighbor over for dinner and i encourage pastors we need to actually encourage from the pulpit and the reason why is because Many Christians think that I can't invite my gay neighbor or even my gay son and his partner in my home because that would be condoning their sin. And I, and I get it. That's a good question. But, you know, Beckett, last time I checked, we usually have sinners over for dinner, right? I mean, it's nothing new. <laughs> We're just eating with them, not sinning with them. So well, that's what I mean. I, uh, by the way, the, the term lifestyle, I wanted to interject because it's so funny. I mean, I always it sounds like a Martha Stewart kind of dinner, you know, dinnerware or something lifestyle. So I, yeah, I always, yeah. when I, when I talk about my former life, I always call it, you know, when I lived as, when I lived that life, I just say life, yeah. I don't say lifestyle. Yeah, right. But um, so what, I mean, what do you say 
to parents whose son wants to bring his boyfriend home for, I mean, this happened to me, but like, what, what do you yeah. say to parents who want, who they, they want to bring their boyfriend home for Christmas, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would. Uh, so this is the balance of, you know, John 1 14, Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. So how do we balance that? Cause it's not easy. And, and I think it comes down to, um, you know, we always want our homes, Christian homes to be a haven, uh, to be an oasis where people can always come. I mean, you know, my really good friend, Rosario Butterfield, she wrote the gospel comes with a house key. And that's how she was wooed to Christ by a retired pastor and his wife who invited her into their home. Didn't even invite her to church. She, she was like, what am I chopped liver? So she's, you know, and, and, she wrote, and I, by the way, she wrote the, the forward to your did. book. Yes. And, and I think that was so, it, it was really wise because, because we oftentimes shove the blame of evangelism on the pastor's shoulders. I don't see that anywhere in scripture. Right. We all have the responsibility for, to, to share the gospel with everyone. So we need to have our home to be a place and, and what a great place for then an opportunity. What a great opportunity for our loved one's partner to then see a home that's built on the foundation. So I would say have them for Christmas dinner. Uh, if they want to stay overnight, and this is where I would kind of the, the, the balance between grace and truth, that I would gladly allow them to stay. I just wouldn't put them in the same room. So I would put them in two separate rooms. So my right. son, you know, if I had a son or daughter, put them in one room and then the partner in the other room. And that's the way that I would treat if I had a daughter walking away, you know, who isn't walking with the Lord and she has her living boyfriend come for Thanksgiving. I would do the same thing. I mean, of course, that would mean hopefully that you would have several several rooms, but yeah. that's how I would kind of balance that. Please come. I would love for you to come. And I know that's really hard for parents because sometimes sure, they see the, the partner as the enemy. And I want to remind parents, your, the partner is not the enemy. That individual needs to know about Christ as well. And so it's kind of opening up the home, but having these clear boundaries that we have. Yeah, my parents were amazing at this. I mean, they were Christians and they were so mm. loving. And and I actually brought a boyfriend home for Christmas one year and they did exactly what you said. They okay. uh, they allowed me to to bring him home, but you know, separate rooms, separate bedrooms. And it was just such a kind of like in that moment, you know, when when uh, it was just my it was really my dad's decision and to me, he was just such a hero to me in that moment. And mm. I still just look back on that time. And I'm, I'm like, he had such wisdom and such grace mm. and love, mm. but you know, he, uh, there was, there were boundaries as well. So it's important. Mm. So I guess the last question is what would you say to people who struggle with same sex attraction and they haven't told anyone in the church hmm. and what, what would you say to them? Yeah, I think, you know, th there's a few things I would tell them um, you're not alone that Satan's best weapon is isolation. He wants you and I and every individual, all of your listeners, um, every person who has same-sex attractions to think that no one can ever understand them. And that's just not true. I mean, of course, I, I can't even understand everything that you're going through Beckett and you can't understand, but you know, of course there's similarities, but the more we try to think of our differences, the more we're going to maybe try to isolate and try to think that, Oh, somehow I'm just too unique. And, and that has even crept into sometimes the church where pastors will come to me and be like, I just had this individual come to me and, and, you know, he has same sex attractions. I don't know what to do. I don't have same sex attractions. And like, they say that three times. I was like, I get it. You don't have same sex attractions. <laughs> but then I, I, I respond and I say, you are able to help a heroin addict, but you don't shoot up with, shoot up with heroin. Do you, you right. can help an adulteress, but you haven't committed adultery yet. You can help a porn addict. And I'm assuming you don't look at pornography. Then why is it all of a sudden for this particular sin you don't know what to do because you yourself don't struggle with that. So we treat these as particular sins. And so the individual who's wrestling right now with their sexuality as a Christian, I want them to know you're not alone. And maybe another thing is don't make this who you are. The world is what's screaming at us right now. Yes. This is who you are, right? I mean, and we're coming out of, you know, Pride, Pride Month. month. 
That's right. And all yeah. the celebration and everyone and their mother and every single business has changed the logo. And so this is, and, and why is it? I, I get it. You get it because it's this false understanding that this is the way people are. And so we're supposed to celebrate people, but these terms, homosexual, heterosexual, bisexual, should not actually define people. They define our experience. They define our attractions, our behaviors, our relationships, but not people. So when we're able to separate that, I think that's a huge step for the individual who has same-sex attractions to be able to then allow God to show them who they are and to be able to, to, to redeem uh, you know, that aspect of their experience that seems so uh, uh, such a core part of who they are and, and a, a significant aspect of their experience, but to say, you know what, God is bigger than all of that. And that regardless of what I feel, regardless of what I think, there's something greater than that. And his name is Jesus. Amen. Well, let's leave it there. I mean, you, you have such wisdom, uh, Christopher, and, and uh, I think this will be very edifying and encouraging to a lot of people. And guys, if again, if you haven't read this book, Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, please get it. And his former book before this one, Out of a Far Country, is a must read. So Christopher, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Beckett. Looking forward to meeting you really real face to face. In person, yes. So thank you guys for joining. I'll see you next week on the Beckett Cook Show.